welcome once again to our YouTube channel. Thanks for subscribing to our channel. Really appreciate you. And in this particular series, we shall be treating past questions from the Jam collection. So we'll be looking at a series of questions that have been asked by Jam over the years. And we'll be giving well-detailed explanations to all of the questions as we come across them. I will implore you to try as much as possible to pay keen attention to all of the explanations that will be given in tackling all of the questions. I wish you success in your exam and please don't forget to subscribe to our channel. Thank you very much. Hi, so welcome once again to our jump series. Today we'll be taking questions from the 2011 jump biology questions. So that is where we are starting from. So let us dive in right away. So this is it, uh, the questions. So uh, we have the question one as usual, the way jump sets it. So let's move straight to question two. Now the question two there says, the function of redhead, the function of the redhead in a male agama lizard is to A, conceal and camouflage the animal from predators, B, scare other males from the territory, C, attract female lizards for mating purposes, and D, we have warm predators of uh, distastefulness of the animal, warm predators of the distastefulness of the animal now looking at this question it is a question that has to do with the adaptations we have a particular topic in biology called adaptation where we talk about the adaptive features of animals and how they actually uh, use this uh, system to uh, carry out their way of life now when we look at this it is actually talking about a uh, structural adaptive feature of uh, finding mates that is particularly what this particular question is talking about. We have different types of adaptive features. We have those that are used by animals for actually uh, getting their food, so, uh, structural adaptive, adaptive features that is used in getting their food, structural adaptive features that is used in helping them to adapt to their environmental temperatures. But for this particular question, when we look at the red head of Agama lizards, the male agama lizards are the ones that usually have that uh, colorful uh, uh, yellow or orange kind of coloration in their head. So when they start to display this particular color, this beautiful color in their head, it is a signal to the female lizards in that environment that the male agama lizard is actually ready for uh, mating. So it is a sign that is uh, portrayed by the Agama lizard, helping them to actually carry out what we refer to as the mating purpose. So that is basically the answer to that particular question. We said our question one. Okay, we have taken question one, which is the normal bonus question for jam. So question two, we said it is the, uh, the C, which is uh, to attract female lizards for mating Purposes. That is basically what that question there is talking about. So our uh, the option for that particular question is option C. Our number two question is option C. So that is that. So let's go to number three. Number three there says, in which of the following species is the biomass of an individual the smallest? In which of the following species is the biomass of an individual the smallest? And then the options that we have we have the buffo uh the agama species option a agama species option b buffo species option c here we have the spirogyra species and option d we have tilapia species what this particular question here is telling us is actually talking about so here we're actually talking about the uh living entity here so we have four species of organisms that have been written out here the option A is Agama species, talking about the Agama lizards. Uh, option B is the Buffo species, which is actually secluded to the uh, the toads. We have option C to be Spirogyra species, and option D is the Tilapia species. So the ones with the smaller, according to the question here, it says what the one with uh, in which of the following species is the biomass of an individual the smallest? So which of these species do we have the smallest uh, organism? So we have it in the tilapia species. That is where we have that particular uh, answer coming from, in the tilapia species. 
and then option okay let's quickly put the answer that down option d and then we have our number four number four what is number four saying number four that says seed plants are divided into seed plants are divided into we have two classifications but let us see all the options that we have there we have the tracheophytes and the ferns we have the angiosperms and the gymnosperms we have the monocotyledons and the dicotyledons and we have the fourth option there option d which is the talophytes and the bryophytes now when we talk about seed plants we are talking about plants that actually have seed leaves so when we talk about this we're talking about the cotyledons so we have plants divided into two which are the monocotyledons and the dicotyledons those are the two types of the gymnosperms that we have so we have the monocots which are plants that have one seed leaf and then the dicots plants with uh two seed leaves so that is the answer to the number four question there which is option c option c is the answer to number four so number five there number five says in which of the following groups of vertebrates is parental care mostly exhibited in which of the following groups of vertebrates is parent parental care mostly exhibited now we have parental care the ability of organism to actually give uh, maternal care or parental care to care for the young ones so we see that in a particular group of these organisms that are written here the options that we have before us we have option a is reptilia option b is amphibia option c is apes and option d is the mammalia again we have option a to be reptilia option b is amphibia option c is apes and option d is mammalia those are the four options that we have and the question there is talking about the ability of organisms to actually uh, show parental care to give parental care that is what that particular question there is talking about so the option that we have in this particular question reptiles do not have the ability to care for their young ones the amphibians also do not care for their young ones as much as the apes but the organisms that have the ability to care for their young ones are the mammals so the mammalia group here the mammals they are the organisms that have the ability to care for their young ones so we have our option there number five to be option d number five is option d so let's go to the next question now uh for the next question we have a uh, diagram here use the diagrams below to answer question six to eight use the diagram below to answer question six to eight so let us see what question six is saying now okay let us study the questions for the organisms that we are seeing here if we look closely what you are seeing here the first one looks more like a locust or a grasshopper you can see the antenna in front here and then this is a cockroach we have something in water we can see water here so i'm guessing this is uh maybe a larva of an organism and then we have caterpillar here so locust or grasshopper we have cockroach we have larva of uh, probably mosquito or whatever and then caterpillar so those are the organisms that we have there so let us see what the question there is saying question six is talking about he said which of the which of the organisms represented a notable agricultural pest which of the organisms represented a notable agricultural pest all right so if you look at this ah uh, number one here locust and then caterpillar i think those are agricultural pests locusts feed on uh, leaves of of uh some plants as well as caterpillar also so i think those are agricultural pests let's see if we have one and four okay we have one and four option one and four so i'll be picking number of, no uh option b because we have two and four here let's see two this is cockroach it is not really an agricultural pest and then one and three this uh three here is not really an agricultural pest because it is found in water 
as you can see we can see them writing water in the bracket we can see what are written directly under here so it tells us that it's not really an agricultural uh pest so i will go with option one which is the low cost and then option four which is uh caterpillar of uh of an organism maybe caterpillar or butterfly or something so that is option uh option b which is uh uh talking about uh specimen one and specimen four so option b is going to be our answer to number six question so number six option b and then we move to the next question which is number seven it says an economic importance of the organism represented by four is that an economic importance of the organism represented by four is that specimen four here yeah, we said it's caterpillar so let's see it transmits waterborne diseases to humans no it is destructive to farm crops yes i'll pick this let's see other options its feces pollutes drinking water it cannot be found in drinking water it helps in the control of mosquito lava no so i will pick numbers uh option b for our number seven question number seven question is uh uh, having uh, talking about uh, specimen four in that diagram that we saw earlier on this number this particular diagram here option uh, specimen four and that question is saying that an economic importance of the organism represented by four is that and I've picked option B which is that it is it is destructive to farm crops that is the answer to that particular question so number seven is option b so option seven uh, sorry number seven question is option b number eight question there says the adult form of three is a vector of the adult form of three is a vector of all right let's see the specimen three this one here that is found in water so they said the adult form so this is the egg or the larva of a particular organism so let's see organisms that lay their eggs in water so we have okay they said the adult form of three is a vector of we have it we, we are having sleeping sickness sleeping sickness is transmitted by says a fly so that is not it we have river blindness we have cholera we have elephantiasis so we could have uh the answer to be that of elephantiasis because that is a type of uh ailments that is transmitted by a vector that can actually have its egg uh in water so what what is this elephantiasis let us quickly see what elephantiasis is so if we look at elephantiasis let me put a short note here elephantiasis it is also known as we also call it the lymphatic filariasis lymphatic filariasis it is transmitted by a particular type of uh, mosquito now we have three types of mosquitoes we have the first one let's quickly talk about them we have the uh, anopheles the Anopheles mosquito, which is actually responsible for transmitting the uh, Plasmodium falciparum, which is the one that causes malaria. Plasmodium falciparum. Malaria. And then we have the, uh, the second one which is the Aedes mosquito Aedes mosquito this one actually is responsible for what we know as yellow fever yellow fever or we also have the dengue fever these are different types of uh, mosquitoes and the third one there the colex mosquito 
So Collins Mosquito is actually responsible for what we are talking about, which is the elephantiasis. Elephantiasis, or like I call it, another name for it is the lymphatic uh, filariasis. So those are the types of uh, mosquitoes that we have. And then the answer to that particular question is the colix mosquito, which is uh, responsible for transmitting the uh, the uh, particular pathogen which is called the elephantiasis so that is the answer to that question the other form of three is a vector of elephantiasis so our option d is the answer to that particular question option d number eight option d is the answer to our question so let us move further let's go to number nine Number nine question that says the adaptive importance of nuptial flight from termite colonies is to the adaptive importance of nuptial flight from termite colonies is to a disperse the reproductives in order to establish new colonies, b provide abundant food for birds and other animals during the early rains, c ensure cross breeding between members of one colony and another and then option d says expel the reproductives so as to provide enough food for other members that is what that particular question there is talking about now nuptial flight is a particular system a particular uh uh we we, we see it as a particular phenomenon that takes place in the termite colonies now there are three different castes of uh, termites. We have the reproductives, we have the workers, and then we have the, uh, the king and the queen. Now, in the reproductives, they are responsible for producing the winged termites uh, and they, sometimes the, uh, the wingless termites. Now, for the winged termites, they are called the reproductives. You actually see them flying out in which you see two of the species having to get attached to uh, one end of the other. The, the, the two termites get attached to, their, to the ends of one another and then they fly, they go out in a flight mood like that. So this is actually what we call the nuptial flight. This is done to disperse the reproductives in order to establish new colonies. When there is a need for expansion of the colonies, that is actually what happens. So we find the termites carrying out what we refer to as nuptial flight in order to establish new colonies to expand their territories. So the answer to that number nine question there is option A, which is to disperse the reproductives in order to establish new colonies. So number nine is option A. Number nine is option A. And so let's move further to the next question, which is number 10. Alright, for number 10, we are having a diagram. It says, use the diagram below to answer question 10 and 11. Use the diagram below to answer question 10 and 11. We have two triple stands here. And what, uh, each of them are attached to test tubes, you can see. For this first one here, for this first tube here, we, are, we can actually see this tube having a connector to the second tube. Now, in the first tube, we have 10% sucrose and yeast in this particular tube here. We have 10% sucrose and yeast. While in the second one here, we have lime water. So those are the things that we have. So the question there says, the gas evolved in the process is, the gas evolved in the process is, now what kind of gas is evolved in this process? Option A, we have carbon dioxide. Option B, we have nitrogen. Option C, we have oxygen. And option D, we have carbon monoxide. Those are the options that we have. Now, this particular reaction here is a fermentation reaction. Where we have the sucrose reacting with the yeast. We can see sucrose here. We can see the sucrose here in this tube here reacting with the yeast. So, every time there is the action of yeast on sucrose or any form of sugar, reaction of sugar and yeast, this is what... Uh, it produces. Let's quickly see the reaction between sugar and yeast. When sugar reacts with yeast, 
it can produce a ethyl alcohol and then carbon dioxide is produced there's the production of ethyl alcohol and then the release of carbon dioxide so basically that is what happens when we have this particular reaction when the sucrose is being acted upon by yeast there is going to be the production of alcohol the particular type of alcohol is ethyl alcohol and then there is going to be the release of a particular gas which is carbon dioxide so that is what that particular reaction is talking about so option a is our answer for number 10 question our number 10 question is option a number 10 option a all right so the next question this is the experimental set up above is used to demonstrate the process of okay now i said that earlier on when we're answering number 10 question now that particular reaction reaction between uh sugar and yeast is a fermentation reaction so that is the answer to that this particular question the experimental setup above is used to demonstrate the process of it is not diffusion it is not photosynthesis it is not plasmolysis but it is fermentation which is option c so option c is our answer to that particular question the answer to that number 11 question is option c so let's move to number 12 number 12 question there says which of the following can cause shrinkage of living cells which of the following can cause shrinkage of living cells option a hypotonic solution option b isotonic solution option c deionized water and option d hypertonic solution first and foremost we quickly need to understand what these uh, different types of solutions or what are what they are so when we talk about hypotonic solution we're talking about a condition whereby the type of uh because in every solution solutions are like this solution we have solute plus solvent now the solute is the dissolvable material the material that is dissolving in another one so oftentimes we have our solutes to be in a uh, solid form or it, it could also take uh, liquid and gaseous form but most times it is in the solid form while our solvents most times are in liquid form so for this particular uh, question we'll be using the scenario where we have our solvents to be a liquid so the solute is a substance that dissolves while the solvent is the substance that helps to dissolve the solute so the solute dissolves in the solvent that is the solution so when we have hypotonic solution in hypotonic solution we are having less solute we have less solute plus a uh, high solvent less solute plus high solvent in this kind of reaction the solute is lower in amount compared to the amount of solute that that particular solvent can dissolve so we have fewer solutes in that particular mixture in that particular solution that means the solvent can still have the ability to, or the solvent still has the ability to dissolve more solutes so it has not reached equilibrium that is what hypotonic solution is and then the next one talking about isotonic solution in isotonic solution, we have equal sol solute plus solvent. Equal solute plus equal solvent. That is what we have in, in isotonic solution. What that is telling us is that the solvent has dissolved the exactly the right amount. The solvent has dissolved exactly the right amount of solute it can dissolve. So there is equilibrium in that particular reaction we are not having fewer solutes or more solutes in that particular solution because the solvent has actually gotten the right amount of solutes that it can dissolve and then the next one is deionized water 
deionized water. When we talk about deionized water, we're talking about water that has been what uh, separated into its complementary ions, such that we are now having the uh, hydrogen ion. hydrogen ion which is represented as this and then we have the hydroxyl ion represented with this so basically that is what that particular one is talking about let me put this right hydroxyl ion So that is how that is so and then we have the last one which is the hypertonic hypertonic solution in hypertonic solution we have more we have more solutes than the solvent So that is what the hypertonic solution is talking about. So if you go to look at that particular question, it says which of the following can cause shrinking of living cell? Now, shrinking of a cell is actually going to result from a particular condition like plasmolysis. When we actually expose a particular living cell to a substance, where there is going to be what the removal of substances inside the organism or inside the living cell to the, to the surrounding. Now, in such a scenario, the, uh, the only condition that will be able to result to that of these four options here, hypotonic solution, isotonic solution, deionized water, and hypertonic solution, is when the substance, the living cell, is dropped in hypertonic solution. Let me explain that further. When a particular substance is dropped, when a particular substance is dropped, Let's assume we have a particular body like this, and then this place here has high amount of, uh, let's say it has high amount of solutes, and then we now drop a particular body here that has fewer amount of solutes. But the solute in this environment here is less concentrated than the solute in this surrounding here. This one has higher concentrations compared to the substances that we have inside the living cell as such this substance in this environment here that has higher concentration is going to pull water from inside this body of the organism here so the pool of water or pool of substances from inside the body of the of the living cell is going to result to shrinking of the cytoplasm of this living cell so the living cell is going to lose its water to the surrounding is losing its water to the surrounding as such there's going to be a reduction in the size of the cell the cell can reduce to this size after it has lost the water in its body so that is basically what that uh, and that particular process is referred to as plasmolysis so that is the answer to that which of the following can cause shrinkage of a living cell it is hypotonic solution when the substance is dropped in hypotonic solution it can result to shrinking of the living cell so our answer there is option d option d is our answer for number 12 option d so let's move to number 13 number 13 says which of the following is true of leukocytes which of the following is true of leukocytes here we are talking about a particular blood cell component a particular blood cell component and we have uh, three major types of solid corpuscles three major types of the solid corpuscles let us see the first one we have the rbc the rbc is called the erythrocyte erythrocyte the rbc meaning a uh, uh, red blood cell is called the erythrocyte and then we have the WBC. WBC is called the white blood cell, also known as the leukocytes. And these leukocytes are divided into two. We have the phagocytes 
and the lymphocytes the phagocytes and the lymphocytes and then we have the third one which is the blood platelet the blood platelet or also known as the thrombocytes the thrombocytes now for the rbc its major function is to help to oxygenate the blood it helps to oxygenate the body so the blood the blood the rbc the red blood cell of the blood corpuscles has the affinity to bind to oxygen so it is responsible for getting oxygen across to our body cells and then the wbc the leukocytes they are our body defense mechanism so they are responsible for fighting and wading off invaders or germs that might want to uh, affect the body or attack the body and there are two in number we have the phagocytes and the lymphocytes and then the third one is the blood platelet which is responsible for blood clotting so basically those are the uh, solid corpuscles of our blood so the question now says which, which of the following is true of the leukocytes so we know we are talking about the uh, phagocytes and the lymphocytes and I said that they are responsible for defending our body against invaders so let us see the options that we have they are respiratory pigments no they are not respiratory pigments because that is the function of the erythrocytes the red blood cell which is responsible for getting oxygen to our body so that is the function of the red blood cell number b, option b that says they are most numerous and they ramify all cells they are most numerous and they ramify all cells uh, well that is not necessarily true option c there says they are large and nucleated option c says that they are large and nucleated while option d says option d says they are involved in blood clotting no option d here is actually talking about the function of the blood platelet the thrombocyte so it is not option a neither is it option d so we are left with option b and option c now sometimes you need to be very very careful when picking options in jump exams sometimes you may have answers that look very very similar so you need to actually do what we refer to as elimination you have to eliminate some of your options now we are left with option b and option c option b says there says they are most numerous and they ramify all cells now we cannot find uh the leukocytes in all the cells but when we look at option c here it says that they are large and they are nucleated yes they are large and nucleated so that is the answer to our uh, question for number 13. number 13 says which of the following is true of the leukocytes the right answer there is option c which says that they are nucleated they are large and nucleated so that is our answer to number 13 option c let's see what question 14 is saying question 14 says the conversion of a nutrient into a molecule in the body of a consumer is referred to as now we need to understand what they are talking about here now we're actually talking about a body so the nutrient going into a molecule and is being converted sorry the nutrient going into the body of an organism and is being converted into a molecule they said it is referred to as what now we are given the options option a digestion of some option b assimilation option c absorption then option d is inhibition let us quickly understand what these uh, four processes what they mean when we talk about digestion digestion is the breakdown of food breakdown of complex let's say complex substances into simpler forms that is what digestion is talking about what we are saying in essence is that when we talk about digestion we're actually talking about the breakdown of food food samples that we put into our mouth they are in complex materials so when they are being broken down they help us to get uh, materials that are absorbable into our body so actually what this question here is talking about if you look at the question it says the conversion of nutrients every class of food have their nutrients the classes of food include carbohydrates uh, protein fat and oil vitamins mineral salts as well as water then roughages 
all of these classes of food they have their nutrients so the conversion of these nutrients in each of the classes of food to an absorbable form in the body of a consumer is actually what this particular question is talking about so the question is actually giving us an answer here and the answer is digestion if you talk about assimilation and absorption that is actually when the body has generated the nutrients and the the nutrient is being uh, absorbed into the blood system into the blood system or the the transport medium that helps to carry out these absorbed nutrients to body organs where they are actually needed so but what this uh, question is talking about is how is the nutrient being converted or being uh, transformed into the molecule that is used by the body and so that process is what we refer to as the option a here which is digestion digestion is the answer to that particular question so for number 14 we have it to be option a so let us go straight to uh number 15 question 15 question says the ability of living organism to detect and respond to changes in the environment is referred to as the ability of living organism to detect and respond to changes in the environment is referred to as option a says locomotion option b says irritability option c says growth and option d says taxes now uh almost all of these are uh the characteristics of living things when we look at the first one that's talking about locomotion locomotion is just talking about movement the ability of an organism to move from one position to another either totally or partially that is part that is what we refer to as uh movement so here it is represented as locomotion option b here is talking about irritability is the response to stimuli that is what irritability is the ability of an organism to respond to stimuli be it external stimuli or internal stimuli and option d is talking about growth where the body has to increase in body size and mass and all of those and here d, option d is taxis now when we look at the answer to this question the ability of a living organism to detect and respond to changes in the environment these changes are what we refer to as stimuli so to detect and to respond to this stimuli is what we refer to as irritability so the, the answer to that question is option b which is irritability when we look at taxis taxis is a response to stimuli 15 option b so let's move to number 16 now 16 there says in mammals the exchange of nutrients and metabolic products occurs in the in mammals the exchange of nutrients and metabolic products occurs in the we have option a lungs option b esophagus option c trachea and option d lymph now these are the options that we have now if you look at this particular question what happens in the lungs is just a uh, exchange of gas exchange of gas that is basically what happens in the lungs it has nothing to do with the exchange of nutrients so here we have just the exchange of gas then it is we have uh, the types of circulation emanating from this point here and basic, basically the type of because we have two types of circulation we have the systemic circulation and the pulmonary circulation lungs plus the heart is stemmed the pulmonary pulmonary circulation while the one that involves other organs other organs plus the heart is called the systemic systemic circulation so in the pulmonary circulation we just have the heart exchanging the lungs uh exchanging the uh gases that we have in the body of that organism so the heart helps to take the carbon dioxide to the lungs so the lungs is able to expel the carbon dioxide then it is replenished with oxygen with fresh oxygen coming from the uh the the nasal cavity into the blood so basically that is what the uh the lungs does and then we talk about the esophagus it is just a passageway through which nutrients get into the body of an organism the passageway from the mouth into the uh, stomach 
it helps to carry out it helps to transport materials from the mouth into the, the stomach that is basically what the esophagus does and then the trachea is a pathway in the respiratory system so the answer to this question is option d which is the lymph it is in the lymph that we have the exchange of nutrients and metabolic processes that is where the answer lies option d option d is the answer to our question number 16 is option d and then number 17 what does question 17 say question 17 here says an example of an endospermous seed is an example of an endospermous seed is option a maize grain option b cashew nut option c cotton seed option d bean seed those are the options that we have option a maize grain option b cashew nuts option c cotton seed and option d bean seed first and foremost we need to understand what endospermous seeds mean so what do we mean by endospermous seeds and endospermous seeds or albuminous or albuminous seeds they are seeds that store their food materials within their endosperm they are seeds that store they store their food materials in their endosperm and we have different example we have examples like castor examples like wheat those are examples of uh, endospermous seeds or albuminous seeds so in this particular question let us see if we have castor we have wheat let us see the options that we have here we have maize grain cashew nuts cotton seeds bean seeds now all of these seeds particularly cashew nuts, cotton seeds, bean seeds, they are, please, this option D here is bean, bean, B-E-A-N. So, these last three here, cashew nuts, cotton seed, bean seed, they are majorly uh, dicots, but option A is uh, a monocot, a maize grain. So, that is an example of an endospermous seed. So, the answer to that question is option A, endospermous seed an example of an experimental seed is maize grain. So that is option A. So we have plus 17 to be option A. And then number 18. Let's see question 18. Question 18 says, okay, we have parasitism, sundew, uh, two here, autotrophism, amoeba, three, saprophytism, algae, and four, heterotrophism, agama. Alright, so the question says, which of the above modes of nutrition is correctly matched with the organism that exhibits it? Parasitism, sundew, autotrophism, amoeba, saprophytism, algae, and then heterotrophism, agama. If we look at this now, we have uh, parasitism. Parasitism is talking about uh, a feeding relationship or a, a relationship where there is a particular uh, organism in that relationship that is uh, called the parasite. It is living, feeding, and, and benefiting from the other organism in the relationship called the host. Now, the parasite always benefits in that relationship while the host does not benefit in that relationship. Sundew does not uh, experience or does not portray such such. Uh, uh, kind of relationship. Sundew is not a parasite. It does not live on and benefit from the host. So that relationship is is not right. Then the, uh, number two, a Roman figure two, we have autotrophism. When we talk about autotrophism, we're talking about organisms that have the ability to manufacture their food by themselves. That is basically what autotrophs are. Organisms that are capable of man, uh, manufacturing their food by Themselves and in this class we have amoeba. Yes, amoeba is an example of an autotroph because it manufactures its own food by itself. 
and then we have option C there let's see what other options are option C is saprophytism saprophytes are organisms that actually they feed or depend on uh, dead decaying materials and algae is not an example of such organism algae does not feed on uh, decaying composites or decaying materials or matter it is not a saprophyte and then the last one there heterotrophism talking about agama we cannot take that as a type of uh, feeding relationship so the right answer to this particular question in number 18 is autotrophism where we have amoeba as an example so let us see option two is autotrophism a our answer to that question is a question 19 says use the following information to answer the question 19 and 20. test tube containing cane sugar and water Roman numeral 1, test tube contains sugar and water. Then, Roman numeral 2, test tube containing sugar cane and dilute, diluted acid. And option 3, test tube containing cane sugar and its degrading enzyme. So the question there says, in which of the, in which of the test tubes will glucose be detected after complete hydrolysis? Now, when we're talking about uh, glucose, detection of glucose here, if you look at the three test tubes, this first test tube here is talking about cane sugar and water. The type of sugar we have here is not glucose. And the second one here also, we have test, tu uh, test tube 2, cane sugar again. In fact, in the three test tubes, we have cane sugar. The only difference is that in test tube A, we have water, as you can see here, we have water in option A. In test tube A, we have water. And then in test tube B, in test tube B, we have uh, uh, diluted acid and then in test tube C, we have degrading enzyme. Now, this diluted acid has the ability to act on the cane sugar. And we also have degrading enzyme having the ability to act on the cane sugar. Now, if you look at hydrolysis here, the diluted acid has the ability to hydrolyze this particular cane sugar. To produce glucose and also in this test tube C uh, Roman numeral 3 we have the degrading enzyme we don't know the type of degrading enzyme but the fact that it is a it is a degrading enzyme it will have the ability to act on the sugar and when sugar is being degraded it has the ability to give us glucose so if the question there says in which of the test tubes will glucose be detected after complete hydrolysis I will say the answer is in test tube B because Hydrolysis can take place after as this dilute acid has been act, has been uh, permitted to act on the sugar. So we have different types of uh, so in that uh, for example, if we use H2SO4 for example as our dilute acid, it has the ability to act on the cane sugar and producing glucose. Also in test tube three, uh, the action of degrading enzyme to act on the sugar can also give us glucose example we have some degrading enzymes like we have sucrose sucrose is a type of sugar when it is acted upon it can give us uh glucose for example it can give us glucose if it is acted upon by a sucrose for example it can give us uh glucose glucose uh, plus fructose so those are examples so if you see now we can see that there is glucose here so that can help us to understand what this question is saying so if you look at that particular reaction there we we'll find out that two and three two and three only has the ability but if you look at this first one here this cane sugar and water the water is only diluting the cane sugar it is not carrying out any conversion of that cane sugar the cane sugar still remains the cane sugar it is not converted to glucose that is why Roman figure one is not part of the uh, option so it is only two and three when hydrolysis of the h2so4 acting on the sugar takes place it can give us glucose and then degrading the enzyme acting on the sugar can also produce glucose so the answer to that question is option b which is for two and three and then we have question 20 Let's see what question 20 is talking about. Question 20 says the enzyme involved in hydrolysis is the enzyme involved in hydrolysis is 
Now, in the idea, remember question, question 20 is a continuation of question 19 because this information here says we should use, it says use the following information, you can see it here, use the following information to answer the questions 19 and 20. So 20 now is saying that the enzyme involved in the hydrolysis is, so let us see, if you look at it now, we have uh, renin, erepsin, sucrase and maltase renin erepsin sucrase and maltase so we have different types of uh enzymes here if you look at it we have different types of enzymes but the one that they said that is acting when hydrolysis of sugar takes place now if you look at this first enzyme here renin renin does not act on sugar renin acts on milk it helps to cuddle milk and why we have erepsin Erepsin acts uh, on uh, peptones. It converts peptones to amino acids. That is what erepsin does. It converts peptones to amino acid. And then we have sucrase. Sucrase helps to convert uh, sucrose to glucose and fructose. We said, okay, I have written for that of sucrose. Let's see that of peptone. Peptone, which is acted upon by erepsin converts a peptone into amino acid and then the third one there we have uh renin okay renin should have been the first one let me write renin codos milk i remember milk is a protein so renin acts on the protein it, it acts on protein milk and it codos the milk and uh maltase Maltase acts on maltose and it converts it to uh, two glucose molecules. So, particularly this question that we're talking about here, we're talking about the type of sugar and it is not maltose that we're talking about. So, it is uh, sucrose. The sugar we're talking about here is sucrose. So, it is being acted upon by sucrose. So, the answer to this particular question is option C. The cane sugar is a sucrose, and so it is going to be acted upon by sucrose. So converting the sucrose to glucose and fructose, that is the answer to that question. So option C is our answer to number 20. Option C, 21. So what is question 21 talking about? Question 21 says... The part of the mammalian ear responsible for the maintenance of balance is the the part of the mammalian ear responsible for the maintenance of balance is the we have option A cochlea option B pinna option C perilymph and option D ossicles so what is the answer to this particular question let us quickly look at each of these options what is a cochlea when we look at the cochlea, for example, is a fluid-filled uh, spiral-shaped cavity that supports hearing and balance. All right, I'm giving out the answer already. The cochlea, okay, let me just, let's, let's start from other options. Let's pick it up from other options. The pinna. The pinna is just uh, a, a collecting uh, or a collector. It's a sound collector. It has to collect and redirect sound. That is what the pinna does. It only helps to, uh, to collect and redirect sound. So let me put it here. Pina collects and redirects sound. That is just what the pinna does. It only collects and then it redirects sound. And then when we look at the perilymph, the perilymph uh, well, as well as the endolymph they have unique uh, composition they have unique composition suited in regulating necess uh, to, to the, the, the help to regulate electrochemical impulse in the ear that is basically what they do the perilymph and the endolymph I said that they are suited for regulating electrochemical impulses. So 
suited to regulate electrochemical impulses basically that is what they are, are functioned to do and this is necessary for hearing impulses necessary for hearing and then if you look at the next one ossicles the ossicles for example and we have three types of ossicles it is a set of bones we have the malleus the incus and the steps we have the malleus the incus and the steps they are sets of bones they are found in the middle ear and they are responsible for transmitting air vibrations into the inner ear that is what they do responsible responsible for transmitting vibrations into the inner ear so if you look at these three that we have talked about we talked about uh the pinna which collects and redirects sound into the ear the perilymph and the endolymph that is suited to regulate electrochemical impulses necessary for hearing and then the third one that we just finished talking about which is the ossicles and i said there are three uh bones in the ossicles we have the malleus the incus as well as the steps all of these three are responsible for transmitting vibrations into the ear they are found in the middle here so they transmit import, uh, vibrations into the inner ear so the ossicles are found in the middle ear then they have to transmit the vibrations into the inner ear where we have the eardrum find the uh the pinna for example is found on the outer ear so the answer to that particular question is that which we have not talked about which is the cochlea so what is the cochlea the cochlea this is a fluid filled medium all right it is a fluid filled spiral shaped medium or organ spiral shaped cavity that supports hearing and balance hearing and balance so if you look at our question our question was actually talking about it says the part of the mammalian ear responsible for the maintenance of balance is now the answer to that question is option a because it is only cochlea that can help to maintain balance in these options that we have so our answer there is option a 21 is a and so we move to 22 what is question 22 saying question 22 says the part followed by air as it passes through the lungs in mammals is the part followed by air as it passes through the lungs in mammals is option a trachea bronchi bronchioles then alveoli option b bronchi trachea alveoli then bronchioles option c trachea bronchioles bronchi alveoli option d bronchioles alveoli bronchi and the trachea now the right pathway in this particular question here of air going through the lungs is in option a the trachea is a passageway that is found uh, side by side with the the esophagus so the trachea actually takes the air from the nasal cavity and passes through the trachea into the bronchi and then the bronchi branches into two smaller tubes which are called the bronchioles so the trachea passes the air into the bronchi and then the bronchi branches into two smaller tubes they are also bronchioles but they are smaller in size compared to the bronchi and that is why they are called bronchioles so the bronchi branches into two bronchioles and then the bronchial branches into smaller vessels called the alveoli so the right pathway of that uh, air 
passing through the lungs is option A, which is trachea, bronchi, bronchioles, and alveoli. So that is the answer to that question. 22 is option A. And then 23. Let's see what question 23 says. The movement response of a cockroach away from a light source can be described as we have A, positive phototaxism, B, negative phototaxism, C, negative phototropism, and D, positive phototropism. Let us quickly look at all of this. When we look at each of them, we will be able to get our answer. Now, we have three types of, basically three types of responses. Basically three types of responses and the responses that we have. We have tropism. We have taxism. And we have nastism. These are the three responses. This one is basically a directional directional response in plants this one is directional response but this time around in animals while this last one here is non-directional non-directional response in either of the two so now we are streamlining our answers now before we go further let me quickly say this again whenever there is a movement towards a particular type because we have different types of uh, uh response depending on the the stimuli that they are reacting to so for we have photo which actually talks about light we have chemo which talks about chemicals we have a uh, hydro which talks about water we have a uh, tigmo and so many other for example this one talks about gravity and so many others so when it moves towards light, it is positive photo, whatever. If it is tropism, that is a particular plant in response to plant, uh, light. If it is chemo, that means the substance is reacting to chemicals. So if it is because we now have it to be either positive, that is response towards while whenever it is negative it is response away from so it could be positive which is response towards the substance response towards the stimuli and if it is uh, negative it means response away from the stimuli so we can have it to be any of these. So it now we now know that positive means response towards, and then negative is response away from. So we now look at the type of stimuli and then the type of organism that we are actually talking about. So let us go back to our question. The question says, uh, the movement response of a cockroach. Now, the fact that it is a cockroach means it cannot be tropism because it is not response from a plant so it is definitely going to be taxism but what kind of taxism they said light so that means it is photo truly so photo taxism so we have option a and b to be photo taxism but is it positive or negative now let us read the question completely it said the movement response of a cockroach away from that is the keyword there away from so if you look at that keyword away from so that is our marker that is what identifies where we are actually going away from so hence we are having our answer to be option b away from means it is negative phototropism so that is the answer to our question there 23 is option b
option B is the answer to our question, which is negative phototropism. Let us look at number 24. Question 24 says, the vascular tissues in higher plants are responsible for A, the movement of food and water, B, suction pressure, C, transpiration pool, and D, the transport of gases and water. First and foremost, we need to understand what we mean by the vascular tissues. In plants, we have two major tissues that are responsible for transporting materials. And those tissues in plants, we have them to be vascular tissues. Okay. From the roots to the stem and leaves. While the phloem conducts nutrients from leaves to storage organs. So these are the two vascular tissues that we have in the body of plants. So let us see what our question there says. It says the vascular tissues in higher plants are responsible for the movement of food and water. So that is the answer to that particular question 24. The movement of food and water is the answer to our question. 24 is option A. Question 25. Let's quickly see what it says. Question 25 says, which of the following organs regulates the levels of water, salt, hydrogen ions, and urea in the mammalian blood? Option A is liver. Option B, we have option B to be kidney, option C is bladder, and option D is colon. Now, if we look at this particular question, we have been given, uh, let me call it a clue to what the answer is. Looking at what we have here to be urea. Urea is a particular substance that is eliminated, uh, it is a degradative uh, form, a degraded form of amino acid. When amino acid is to be eliminated from the body, it is deaminated and then turned into urea before it is removed from the body. And it is re uh, removed from the body through the kidney. But let's quickly look at the question. Let's assume we didn't have a clue like I just said. Let us look at all of these organs, the liver, kidney, bladder, colon, one after the other, and then we look at their functions. That way we'll be able to get our answer. What is the liver? The liver is uh, more or less the largest organ that is found in our body and the major function of the liver is uh, detoxication. Detoxication and then it is uh, helpful in the elimination of sugar. How does it eliminate sugar? It does this by actually helping to store uh, excess sugar in the blood. When there is excess sugar in the blood, it is converted Let's, let's, let me put down the note. When there is excess sugar in the blood, we see it converted to, okay? Excess sugar is converted by a particular hormone called insulin. Insulin does the conversion of excess sugar and it is converted to glycogen. And so this glycogen is stored in the liver. So this is how the uh, liver actually helps to uh, uh, monitor, helps to uh, actually carry out what we refer to as the removal of blood sugar. So that is the function of uh, the liver. Then the kidney, it is responsible for the uh, regulation of water. How? It helps to eliminate excess water in the body. It eliminates excess water in the body. Yes, it does this. It is a very, very uh, great marker when it comes to the removal of water. It is also responsible for uh, uh, elimination of toxic waste. Elimination of toxic waste. 
It is also responsible for elimination elimination of the degradative form of amino acid. Of amino acid, which is actually what we refer to as urea. So these are some forms, uh, some functions of the kidney. So from that now we can see. Now let us look at the bladder. The major function of the bladder, the bladder, is actually a storage site. A storage site for urine. Yes, that is basically what the bladder is from. It is a storage site that helps to collect urine that comes from the kidney. So when the urine is formed from the kidney, it is stored in the bladder before uh, elimination takes place. And then the last uh, material that we have there, colon, is a part of, the colon is a part of the uh, intestine, a part of the large intestine. That is what the colon is. So for this particular question, question 25, it is actually the function of the kidney. The kidney is responsible for carrying out all of this function. Elimination of water, salt, hydrogen ions, and the rest of those. That is actually the function of the kidney. So the answer to our number 25 question is option B. B, that is the answer to our 25th question. And then let's go to number 26. Question 26, there says... The sequence of the one-way gaseous exchange mechanism in a fish is A. Operculum, gills, mouth B. Gills, operculum, mouth C. Mouth, operculum, gills and D. We have mouth, gills and the operculum. Now, let us quickly look at this and then analyze what the answer will be. When we look at the part of a fish, let me quickly do... A, a rough sketch of what we are talking about let's assume we have a fish like this and then we have the fins like this here we have something here and then we have something like this let's let's just Let's, let's see this as our fish. Now, this part here is what we refer to as the operculum. This, this part here is our operculum. Now, when we open this operculum, we actually have what is inside it to look this way. What we have inside it looks somewhat like this. Those things are called the gills inside the operculum when we open the operculum. So this is the actual sequence. When fish opens its mouth, it permits water and other materials to go into the mouth. So water and then the food samples, they go into the mouth. So we have the mouth. And then from the mouth, all of these things are sieved by the uh the gills the, the the substance that enters into the mouth they get in contact with the gills first so we have the gills before we now have what the operculum opening to permit the uh the filtrates to come out you know when when we filter something we always have the filtrate and the residue so the filtrate is what comes out in this uh, scenario we have the, the water and the waste material that comes out where the gills help to trap what the fish actually needs. So after the gills is where we now have the operculum. So that is the right sequence in this particular question. We have mouth, gills, and then the operculum. So that is the right sequence. Let's see our question again. It says the, ex the sequence of the one-way the sequence of the one-way uh, gaseous exchange mechanism in a fish is. So if we look at that question now, we're actually talking about uh, gaseous exchange. So that means when the water enters into the mouth, because we know that uh, fishes, they actually breathe using 
uh, they, they, they take in oxygen from water. The oxygen is dissolved form of oxygen in water. It's dissolved oxygen that is found in water. So the water will actually need to go into the mouth. Then the gills will do the filtration, taking out the oxygen that is needed before the excess of the water or the remainant is taken out of the body through the upper column. So that is how that answer is. So we have the mouth, the gills, and the upper column. That is option D for 26 question. Option D is our answer. Then D. The question for 27 says, The type of asexual reproduction that is common to both paramecium and protist is A. Budding B. Sporulation C. Fragmentation and D. We have fission. Let us quickly look at all of these. These are asexual types of reproduction. The four of them here, they are asexual types of reproduction. So let us see what they mean. And then from there, we'll be able to get our answer to that particular question. So what is budding? Budding is the cutting. of a bud from a mature organism so that is actually what budding is cutting of a bud from a mature organism then sporulation sporulation is actually formation of spores is the formation the formation of spores then we have other ones like uh, fragmentation and then fission fragmentation fragmentation is the cutting into fragments in which the cut fragments mature into whole organisms that is basically what fragmentation is talking about so all right now i've looked at budding which is budding is the cutting of a bud from a mature organism uh, from a mature organism yes and then we looked at sporulation we said it is the formation of spores and then the next one we looked at we said it is fragmentation which is the cutting into fragments in which the cut fragments mature into whole organisms so the last one we have there is uh we have the last one to be fission fission is the development of two daughter cells from a parent organism after cell division after cell division has taken place or cell division has occurred that is actually what fission is. So let's look at our. Now we understand the four co concepts that has been made mention of here. Budding, we have spor uh, sporulation, we have fragmentation as well as fission. Now for paramecium and protist, yes, they are both uh, uh, organisms that actually carry out uh, some type of uh, reproduction that actually require them to. Uh, go into cell division. So the answer to this question is not budding because they do not have outgrowth of buds and it is not sporulation because they do not produce spores. Also, it is not fragmentation because they are not organisms that produce fragments, but they are what organisms that go into uh, binary fission. So the answer to that question is fission. That is option D. So 27 is option D. And so we move to question 28. 28 there says, 28 says, In nature, 
Plants and animals are perpetually engaged in mutualism because option A, they are rivals, option B, option A that says they are rivals, option B says all animals rely on food produced by plants, option C says they utilize respiratory waste by each of each other, and option D says they are neighbors. Now we need to understand what uh, this, this part, where this particular question is coming from. Where we talk about mutualism actually it is coming from types of associations now i will just make mention of the types of association that we have i will not be having much time to actually go into explaining all of them uh one after the other so i will just make mention of the types. so the first one there we have parasitism in parasitism we have two organisms one is called the parasite and the other is called the host the parasite lives and benefits on the host it lives at the expense of the host the host is not benefiting anything it is only the parasite that is benefiting in that relationship and that is why i call it a plus and a minus relationship so the parasite is benefiting in that relationship example we have the relationship between mosquito and man a mosquito benefits from the man because the mosquito sucks human blood to help hatch its eggs but the host which is man humans they do not benefit anything from the parasites instead they lose in that relationship where the parasites which is the mosquito drops the plasmodium in their blood which eventually causes them to have malaria so that is parasitism the next one is called mutualism when we talk about mutualism, mutualism is a kind of relationship where we have two organisms. The two organisms are contributing in that relationship and they are both benefiting from that relationship. So it is more or less a give and take relationship. Two organisms. So I call it a plus plus relationship because they are both what, contributing into that relationship and they are both benefiting from the relationship example we have a cattle and an egret a cattle benefits from an egret because the egret which is a white bird with long legs and long beaks thin long legs and beaks uh, the cattle benefits from the egret by the egret actually helping to eat up bugs that are uh, feasting on the cattle so the egret feasts or eats the bugs that are feasting on the cattle and so that is how the cattle benefits from the egret in turn the cattle is showing appreciation or providing a beneficial effect to the egret by actually moving the egret about from place to place and actually giving the egret food to eat so that is what we refer to as a mutual relationship and then the third one there we have commensalism Commensalism. In commensalism, we have two organisms. One is called the commensal. One is called the commensal, and the other is called the host. In this relationship, the commensal is benefiting from that relationship. The commensal is benefiting from that relationship, but the host is not benefiting from the relationship neither is it losing it is not benefiting and at the same time it is not losing from that relationship that is a commensalism relationship a commensal relation a relationship example of such relationship we have a relationship between shark and remora fish now the shark is a very big fish that feasts on smaller fishes if it feeds on smaller fishes like the uh the titles like the mackerels the salmonellas and the rest of those Remora fishes are very very small they are not eaten by the sharks the sharks do not eat the the remora fishes because the, the remora fishes are just too tiny to actually fool the sharks as such the remora fishes find a harbor beside sharks so they just leave the remora fish and as, as an example of a commensal lives beside a shark because it knows that the shark will not feast on it so it's just, it survives beside the shark, while the shark in turn provides shelter to the remora fish. Now, 
the shark is not benefiting from that relationship because the, sh the remora fish is not giving the shark anything but if we look at the remora fish the remora fish is benefiting it is having free shelter and protection in the environment of the shark because no smaller fishes will be able to come to eat up the remora fish so that is what we refer to as a commensal type of relationship and the fourth one we have the profitism In saprophytism, we have a particular organism called the saprophyte. The saprophyte. The saprophyte. Saprophytes are organisms that actually feed on dead or decaying organisms. They feed on dead or decaying organisms. So let me stop here. We have, we have some other types of association though. So we have parasitism, we have mutualism, we have commensalism, and we have uh, saprophytism. Now, I said mutualism is a type where we have two organisms and the, both of them contribute into the relationship and they both benefit from the relationship. So let us go back to our question now. Our question there says, in nature, plant and animals are perpetually engaged in mutualism. The word mutualism is here. So mutualism meaning that plants and animals are benefiting from one another. So if we say that they are rivals, it means they are not actually benefiting from one another. Instead, they are hunting one another. If we look at option B, they all animals rely on food produced by plants. Yes, animals rely, but not all animals. But we could say all animals because we either depend, animals depend directly or indirectly on the plants. We have the herbivores that depend directly on the plant. Then we have the, the carnivores and the omnivores that depend indirectly on the plants but if we look at this option here then how are the plants benefiting from the animals so it is this is not actually looking like a mutual relationship if you look at option c that they utilize respiratory waste of each other i think this is our option because if you look at it plants produce the they plants take in carbon dioxide and they produce oxygen as their respiratory waste this oxygen is used by animals as their own uh, uh, respiratory or gaseous uh, substance. Animals rely on the use of oxygen. And in turn, animals produce their own respiratory waste to be carbon dioxide that is relied upon by the plant. So I think this is the mutual relationship here. The waste product of one is the byproduct of the other. Plants rely on the use of carbon dioxide that is produced by animals, and animals rely on the use of oxygen that is produced by plants. So the answer, okay, then the option D there says that they are neighbors. That is not necessarily the answer. So the answer to that question is uh, option C for number 28. Option C. Option C. And then we have question 29. Question 29 there says... In an experiment to determine the percentage of humus and water in a soil sample, the following results were obtained. Weight of the evaporating basin alone, 80.5 grams. Weight of, weight of the basin and soil, 101.5 grams. Weight after drying the soil in the oven, 99.0 grams. Weight of basin and roasted soil, 95.5 grams. So let us write out these parameters and then we try to use it to answer our question. Weight of evaporating basin, and that was, we have it to be 80.5 grams. 80.5 grams. And then the next one there, we have weight of basin and soil. Basin and soil to be 101.5 grams. And soil, 101.5 grams. 101.5 grams. And then the third one there, we have weight after drying the soil in the oven. Weight after drying the soil in oven to be 99 grams. Weight after drying the soil. Weight after drying soil in oven that gave us 99.0 grams and then we have another parameter which is the weight of basin and roasted soil weight, weight of basin and roasted soil weight of basin and roasted soil 
that gave us let's see it gave us 95.5 grams 95.5 grams so what is the question they said the percentage of humus in the soil sample is the percentage of humus in the soil sample is a 16.7 percent c b 17.6 percent c 26.7 percent and option d we have 16.2 percent so let us see we actually need to extrapolate some things from this if we have weight of evaporating basin alone to be 80.5 grams and then evaporating basin plus soil to be 101.5 grams it means our weight of soil is going to be 101.5 grams minus 80.5 grams so if we look at that we have 21 21 grams 21 grams so if we have the answer to that and then they said wait after drying soil in oven after they had dried the soil in oven they had 99 grams so if we subtract the weight of the soil now dried soil from the weight of the basin this is weight of dried soil so we have it to be 101.5 grams minus 99 grams this one is weight of wet soil and then weight of dried soil so weight of dried soil 101.5 grams minus 99 grams so the weight of the dry soil now is 2.5 grams so we have the weight of our wet soil to be 21 grams and the weight of our dry soil to be 2.5 grams now they said after uh, the weight of the basin and roasted soil now after they had taken out the soil from the oven then they roasted the soil then they had 95.5 grams so we have dried soil to be 99 this is dried soil is uh 2.5 grams and then uh let's see the weight of the roasted soil now what happened when they actually because here the difference between the wet soil and the dry soil is just water from this place to this place here removal of water so that is just the difference they removed water from this one here when the soil was wet they removed water till when it was uh, dried so that was just the difference so then from that point there when they had the dried soil they said weight of evaporating dish uh, plus the soil after drying the soil in oven they had 99.0 grams and then weight of the basin after they roasted they now had 95.5 so removal of the uh if you subtract weight of basin and roasted soil from weight of basin and soil after drying soil in oven we'll be having 99.0 minus 95.5 that should give us after roasted now what we have there for the humus which is what has been removed humus is what has been removed when the soil got roasted from when it was actually removed from the oven so we have 3.5 grams so 3.5 grams is the weight of the humus so the question now is asking us that what is the percentage it says what is the percentage of the humus that's what we have here it says the percentage of humus in the soil sample is the percentage of humus in the soil sample so we have the humus to be this this is the humus and then the soil sample all of the soil sample together we have it to be this 21.0 grams so what is the percentage of the so of the humus from the whole of the soil sample so what we are having there we are having uh, the humus to be 3.5 and then the soil is 21.0 what we should be having is 3.5 divided by 21.0 multiplied by 100 over 1 the answer we should be getting should be we should be getting 16.667 when we round off it's going to give us 16.77 percent
percentage? That is going to be the answer to our question. 16.7%. So that is option A. 29 is option A. And then question 30. What is question 30 saying? An example of a future feeding animal is an example of a future feeding animal is a shark b butterfly c whale and d mosquito a shark is a carnivorous animal it is carnivore in nature it doesn't filter feed what we're talking about here is animals that actually filter their food before they feed uh, a shark is a carnivore so it actually hunts its prey and then feeds directly on them so it is not a filter feeder then butterfly is uh, a fluid feeder is a fluid feeder because it uses butterfly and mosquito in fact they are both fluid feeders because they feed on liquid or uh, fluid fluidy substances butterfly feeds on the nectars of plants mosquito feeds on the blood of animals so the both of them make use of the, so, uh, a particular uh, tube-like structure called proboscis. Proboscis, that is it, the tube-like structure. Tube-like structure in their mouth part. So it is what they insert into the body of animals when they are actually uh, intending to feed on the animal. The only organism here that is filter feeder is the whale. When they are the whales, they open their mouths, allow all the organisms to enter into their mouths, the small fishes or aquatic animals, and then alongside water. And then they open the particular opening on the back of their head to permit the water to get out of the body of the, of the organism and that, after that is done the organism, the whale, traps only the organism it, it would have filtered out the only organism that it wants to feed on that is why we call whales filter feeders so the answer to this question is op option C that is the answer to that question and so 31 31 the question for 31 says which of the following is a feature of the population pyramid of a developing country a we have long lifespan b we have low birth rates c we have low death rates and d short lifespan so let us quickly explain them one after the other we are looking at a particular com uh, community or country that is having developing uh, population pyramid that means there is increase in population in that economy in that community now when we look at long lifespan long lifespan can result to increase in the population of a community yes when people there are having very lengthy lifespan it can result to increase in the population of that community then low birth rate when there is low birth rate the community will start having low or reduction in the population size so this cannot be it option b is not it option c says low death rate. when people the the mortality rate in that community is low it means people are not dying when people are not dying it can result to people having or that country having increase in population size and then the third one the last option there says short lifespan when people have short lifespan it means they die at an early age if they die at an early age, it means the country's population size will be dwindling, it will drop. So, option B and option D are outrightly out of the equation. So, we have option A and option C. Now, when we look at long lifespan, something must have been responsible for the organisms in that community to have long lifespan. So, we will not quickly see that as a feature of the population pyramid. But if we look at low death rate, low death rate can be uh the reason why the organisms they are having a uh, long lifespan when they are not dying early then they will have a longer lifespan so the answer to question 31 is option c which is low death rate low death rate and 32 now 32 question 32 says 
The interaction of a community of organisms with its abiotic environment constitutes a a niche, b a food chain, c an ecosystem, and d a micro habitat. If you look at these four things here, the options there, let us quickly see them one after the other. When we talk about a niche, we're talking about a place that uh, is specifically built for an organism. A niche is a special habitat for a specific type of organism. That is what a niche is, a special habitat for a specific type of organism. In that habitat, there is only one particular type of organism there. Example, we have a termitarium. In a termitarium, the only organisms we have there are termites. We have other examples like we have the beehive where we have only the bees. So those are examples of niches. Now, if we look at the next one, a food chain. A food chain is just talking about a linear feeding relationship. A food chain is a linear feeding relationship. That is what a food chain is talking about. It is a type of feeding relationship that is just what a straight line equation. We have A being fed upon by B and so the energy in A moves into B and C feeds on B and then the energy in B moves into C. So we see it is a straight line equation. That is what food chain is about. And then the next one we have an ecosystem. An ecosystem is an interaction the living organisms with their non-living environment that is what an ecosystem is, an interaction between living organisms with their non-living environment. And when we look at the last option there, a microhabitat is just talking about a small habitat where organisms dwell. A small dwelling place. Now, if you look at this that has been said, the question there says, interaction of community of organisms with its abiotic environment constitutes, the answer there is the ecosystem. The C is an option C. And then 33, we have the question that the vector of the malaria parasite is, we have three types of mosquitoes, types, of mosquitoes one we have the anopheles anopheles mosquito two we have the colex and three we have the aedes we have the anopheles mosquito colex mosquito and aedes mosquito so the answer to our question there is the anopheles mosquito. The female anopheles mosquito is the one that transmits the malaria parasite. So B is our answer to it's our answer to question 33 and now 34. It says which of the following instruments is used to measure relative humidity? We have hydrometer. Hydrometer is used to measure density as well as the specific, specific uh, gravity of water. That is what uh, hydrometer is used to measure. We have 
the second one which is thermometer it is used to measure temperature we have the third one which is hygrometer which is actually the answer to our question it is used to measure relative humidity and water vapor and then the fourth one there an anemometer is used to measure the wind speed so the answer to our question is option c which is uh i grow meter option c i grow meter 35 question 35 says exo erythrocytic phase of life cycle of malaria parasite occurs in the a we have the liver of the humans b reticulo endothelial cells of humans c malfigian tubules of mosquito and d the brain of the mosquito where do we have the uh, exo erythrocytic phase of the life cycle of the mosquito when we talk about uh, the exo erythrocytic phase of mosquitoes the life cycle of that parasite takes place outside the erythrocytes we can see erythrocytic phase here when it is outside the erythrocytes where is it where is this phase taking place it actually takes place in the liver of the humans that is where that particular uh, uh, phase of the life cycle of malaria parasite takes place the life cycle the erythrocytic phase of the life cycle of malaria parasite takes place in the liver of the organism so that is the answer to that question a then 36 question 36 says habitats are generally classified into habitats are natural dwelling place of organisms and they are generally classified into biotic and about option a biotic and abiotic option b aquatic and terrestrial option c arboreal and marine option d micro habitat and macro habitat now let us look at the options biotic and abiotic case yes, talking about living and non-living that is not the classification of the habitat if you look at option b aquatic and terrestrial aquatic are organis uh, habitats where we have organisms that dwell in water while terrestrial are environments where we have organisms that dwell on land and then we have the third one which is arboreal and marine we have arboreal and marine arboreal yes in the air and marine in the water biomes and then we have macro habitat and micro habitat micro they're talking about habitats that consist of uh micro organisms while macro habitats consist of macro organisms now if you look at this one here option b aquatic and terrestrial i know that is the answer to our question uh number 36 because majority of the arboreal organisms because we, we should have uh, been told that they have three uh classifications but they said generally classified into and they excluded arboreal from this place here now we have majority of the animals to be either aquatic or terrestrial even the ones that we can classify as arboreal eventually get to land on a particular spot which is on the terrestrial uh, habitat so the major answer the answer to that question 36 is going to be the aquatic and terrestrial which is option b 36 is option b that is the answer to our question 36 option b and then we have 37 through concholiasis can be contacted through eating contaminated food drinking contaminated water baiting in contaminated water and bites of black fly so what what is actually this drucunculiasis is caused or transmitted by bites of guinea worm and guinea worms are found in uh, contaminated water that is where we find these guinea worms they are found in contaminated water so the answer to our question there is drinking of contaminated water so drucunculiasis can be contacted through drinking contaminated water option b the answer to our question and then question 38 what is question 38 saying which of the following groups of environmental factors are density dependent a 
food salinity accumulation of metabolites and light b we have temperature salinity predation and disease c we have food predation disease and accumulation of metabolites and then d temperature food disease and light which one of these groups can all result to a large uh, group of organisms in a particular environment now if you look at light food can actually cause that food can actually result to uh, uh, density dependency but salinity cannot result to density dependency salinity cannot cannot result to that if we have accumulation of metabolites yes accumulation of metabolites can actually result to that and then light also in a way light can also result to that so since we have salinity here yeah, this answer is not right option b we have temperature salinity predation and disease we also have salinity here so the answer is not right option c this is food predation disease accumulation of metabolites yes disease can result to density dependency food predation can result to density dependency as well as accumulation of metabolites but if you look at the last one here temperature food disease and light we cannot take this one because of the light that is there so answer to that question there question 38 is option c which is food predation disease and accumulation of metabolites option c that is the answer to our question option c and then we have question 39 what is question 39 saying question 39 says millet sorghum maize and onions are common crops growth in nigeria in the a tropical rainforest b sudan savanna c mountain forest and d sahel savanna in this particular question we need to look at the areas that we're actually talking about these crops that are seen here they are grown in the southwest uh north central of nigeria so those areas are parts that are found in the sudan savanna so the answer to that particular question there is the sudan savanna which is option b option b sudan savanna and then question 40 in which of the following biomes is the southwestern part of nigeria located in which of the following biomes is the southwestern part of nigeria located similar to what we just talked about and that is going to be the rain forest the tropical rainforest that is where we have in the southwestern part of nigeria the tropical rainforest the desert is up north the temperate forest is down south the tropical woodland is uh the north central so we have uh the tropical rainforest in the north uh, southwestern part of nigeria but 40 is option b option b question 41 what is question 41 telling us the inheritable characters that are determined by a gene located on the s chromosome is we have the options here a recessive b sex linked c homozygous and d dominant now when we look at this particular factor here x chromosome the only chromosome that uh, is different in both the male and the female organism is the uh, the gonad chromosome or the sex chromosome so we have x chromosome and the y chromosome the x and the y chromosome they are the sex chromosomes so this particular question here is talking about the sex chromosome so that is the answer to our, our question here which is the sex linked chromosome so the answer to 40, 41 question is uh, option b option b and then question 42 says lack of space in a population could lead to an increase in water scarcity birth rates increase in death rates and increase in doubt yes when there is a uh, lack of space in the population lack of space can lead to water scarcity but that is not what you're actually talking about because if there is surplus of water it may not lead to scarcity of water 
it does not necessarily have to cause increase in birth rate but it will definitely result to increase in disease rate because it will be easier for a particular disease to spread in an environment that does not have uh, adequate space or ventilation so that is the answer to question 42 option c option c is the answer to question 42 and then question 43 we have if the cross of a red flowered plant with a white flowered plant produces a pink flowered plant it is an example of a co-dominance b incomplete dominance c mutation and d linkage in this particular question we can see that every time we have a red flower plant and white flower plant and we are now having a generation of a pink flower plant it means the red flower and the white flower has been duly represented in the offspring which is the pink flowered plant so in this it is saying that the both uh, flowered plant which is the white and the red flowered plant have both contributed to the type of offspring that has been generated so it is called a co-dominance uh, type of uh, generation so it is co-dominance it is an example of co-dominance it is not incomplete dominance because we can actually see that there is dominance there and it is not mutation nor is it linkage it is actually co-dominance that is option a for question uh, 43 and then 44 says which of the following theories was not considered by darwin in his evolutionary theory a variation b survival of the fittest c use and disuse and then d competition now in the study of evolution darwin was able to actually build more on theory of jean lamarck so lamarck was able to tell us about the use and disuse of body parts as well as the organism being able to transfer the acquired traits so those were some of the things that Darwin built on. So Darwin actually talked about survival of the fittest, which can result to elimination of some weaker generations of the organisms. It also talked about the use and disuse of body parts and then competition. The only thing that Darwin did not talk about is variation. So that is the only theory that was not talked about or considered by Darwin. So 44 is A, variation. And then question 45. Question 45 says the crossing of individuals of the same species with different genetic characters is A. Crossbreeding, B. Polygenic inheritance, C. Non disjunction, and D. Inbreeding. Now we need to actually look at this. Same species. Now, when we look at a cross of individuals of the same species, when we look at such cross, we are actually looking at inbreeding. The breeding is in-house. The breeding is not outside. It is not of different species. Since it is a species, it is the same species, the crossing is inbreeding. So that is the answer to our question. When we look at cross-breeding, cross-breeding is actually looking at the crossing of two different species of an organism. So that is not what we are talking about. So we are just looking at the same species of organism. We are just trying to cross different traits. Possibly we are looking at the same uh, species of dogs, but one has longer ears, whereas the other has shorter ears. So it is the trait of the ears that we are actually trying to uh, work on. So since it is the same species, it is actually in breeding. It is different from crossing different species of organisms say you are crossing a dog with a cat that would have been a cross breeding but since it is the same type of species it is in breeding so the answer is d for 45 option d and then 46 question 46 says the number of alleles controlling blood groups in humans we have how many when we look at the blood groups we have a we have b and we have o I will not put a b because a b is from a as well as it being from o so i will just list these three as the ones that we have one two and then three so those are the number of alleles 
that control blood groups in humans? So the answer is option A. Option A is the answer to that 46th question. It's option A. And then 47, 47, what is question 47 saying? During blood transfusion, agglutination may occur as a result of reaction between contrasting antigens and antibodies. B, two different antigens. C, two different antibodies. And D, similar antigens and antibodies. For these attributes that are found in the blood. So let us look at them. We have blood groups. Blood groups, we have A, B, A, B, and O. Those are the blood groups that we have. A, B, A, B, and O. And then we have antigens. Antigens and antibodies. We have antigens and antibodies. So let us see what all of this, what they actually mean. When we look at the antigens and antibody, for A, he has antigen A and is has anti B antibody. A has antigen A and anti B antibody. While B has antigen B and anti A antibody. A B here does not have any antibody because it has what antigen A and antigen B. So it does not have any antibody. A B does not have any antibody. While O here has no antigen as such it has anti A and anti B antibody. So those are the attributes of each of the blood types. So if there is going to be blood clots, it is going to be that a particular blood sample, okay, let's quickly talk about the donor and the recipient. Donates to and receives from. If you look at this now, that should help uh, us understand what you are talking about. A. A can donate blood to any blood group that does not have anti-A. Because A has antigen A, it can donate blood to any blood group that has antigen A, but that does not have anti-A antibody. So which blood groups has antigen A? The only blood groups that have antigen A, we have A, and then we have the second one to be AB. AB also has antigen A, so we have AB. Those are the bloods that have what antigen A. Then when we look at B, B has antigen B, so it can donate its blood to any blood group that has what antigen B. So the only blood groups that have antigen B we have what the blood group b and blood group a b a b now okay so if we if we understand these two here now then receives blood from a has anti b so a cannot receive from b a is against b that is the meaning of the anti here a is against b so any blood that has antigen b cannot donate blood to a so what blood groups has antigen B? We have B. B has antigen B. Then A, B also has antigen B. So A cannot receive blood from A. It cannot receive blood from A, B. And then if you look at something similar to that happens in B also in blood group B. B has antigen B, but it is against A. So any blood that has antigen A, will not be able to donate blood to B because it is against A. So all the blood that have antigen A, like A, 
and then a b here also will not be able to donate blood to the b blood group so we understand this now let us now move to a b a b has antigen a and antigen b but it does not have any antibody so if we look at the donation now donates to a b cannot donate blood to a why because a has anti b remember that a b has antigen b and since it has antigen b it will not be able to donate blood to a because a is against b so it cannot donate to a and it cannot also donate to b because it has anti a antibody the b blood group has anti a antibody that is an antigen that a b has so it will not be able to donate towards a b but it can donate to b to a b it can donate to itself because it does not have any antibody so a b can donate to a b but a b can it receive blood from since a b does not have any antibody it can receive from a it can receive from b it can receive from a b and then let us look at o here can a donate blood to o no a cannot donate blood to o because a has antigen a and the o has anti a antibody so it cannot donate to o then b also cannot donate to o because b has anti a antibody which o has so donate blood to o donates to a because o does not have any antigen so it can donate to a it can donate to b it can donate to a b and it can also donate to o but where can o receive blood from o can only receive from o so understanding this now the question now says that during blood transfusion agglutination may occur as a result of reaction between so that agglutination there is just talking about blood clots agglutination means blood clot that is basically what agglutination is so the options that we have contrasting antigens and antibodies so when there is despairing antigen and antibody or two dif uh, different antigens two different antibodies and the last option there is similar antigen and antibody so let us see the option so if a is to receive blood now a must get blood from another blood group that has antigen a so it means if a gets its blood from any blood group that has anti b there will be blood clots because its antibody is what b so it is contrasting uh antigen and antibody contrasting in the sense that antigen is a and antibody is b or antigen is b and antibody is a that is the contrasting so the answer to that question is option a it says what contrasting antigen and antibody so 47 question is option a that option a and then 48 question 48 says the fallacy in Lamarck's evolutionary theory was the assumption that traits are acquired through use and disease of body parts acquired traits are heritable acquired traits are seldom formed and traits are acquired through the use of body parts that is question 48 the fallacy is that the traits are acquired through use and disuse of body parts no the fallacy in Lamarck's evolutionary theory was the assumption that traits are acquired through disuse of body parts when there is disuse of body parts it is not possible for a particular trait to be what to be acquired use uh, disuse of body parts will only result to wasting so it cannot actually uh get to the point where the organism will be able to acquire it and then transfer it to the next organism so the answer to that question is option a 48 option a and then 49 49 says the bright colored eye spots of the wings of moths are an example of 
A. Warning coloration. B. Disruptive coloration. C. Crypsis. And D. Mimicry. It is mimicry. It is not warning coloration because it is not using it to warn of organisms. It is mimicry because it uses it to actually camouflage itself with its surroundings so it can actually hide away from predators. So that is the answer to that question. Mimicry. Option D. And then, 50th question. The wings of a bat and those of a bird are examples of A. Convergent coloration B. Continuous variation C. Co-evolution and D. Divergent uh, evolution What are we talking about when we talk about converging and divergent evolution? Because that is where the answer lies Divergent evolution is when individuals in one species individuals in a species or closely related species or closely related species acquire enough variations acquire enough variations in their traits that it leads to that it leads to new distinct species that is basically what divergent evolution is we have two uh, organisms they, they may be of the same species or of different species they are related but they acquire enough variations in the traits that leads to new distinct species that is divergent evolution and when we talk about convergent evolution this one is talking about the opposite where different species is when two unrelated species two unrelated species of organisms develop similar traits develop similar traits because they live in similar environments owing to living in similar environment so that is basically what divergent and convergent evolution is talking about for divergent evolution we have same species living in the same environment and then they are developing uh, distinct uh, traits developing traits that make them differ where convergent evolution is talking about organisms of different species developing similar traits because they are found in the same environment so when we look at this question here the wings of a bat and those of a bird are examples of a converging evolution b discontinuous evol uh, variation c coevolution and d divergent evolution now looking at the uh, options here we want to say that it is divergent evolution why why will we pick divergent evolution this is very simple because we have bats and birds to be organisms of similar species but the, the, the wings are now different the wings of a bat they are different from those of the wings of a bird they are organisms that live in similar environments and they are organisms of similar species related species but their 
developing traits that make them look different from one another so the answer to that question is option d option d so here we have come to the end of our jam 2021 uh, biology question and answer series i will please be with you to try as much as possible to go through all that has been discussed Try to understand the answers given to each of the questions so we, when you get related questions, you will know how best to answer them in your exam. I want to wish you success in your exam. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel. Please extend our channel links to your, your friends and then like our content, share them as well. I want to, get, want to hear from you. So please reach out to us on our comment section. When subscribing to the channel, don't forget to click on the notification button so you can get easily notified of subsequent uploads. I wish you all success in your exams. Thank you very much and God bless.